Hello, I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and welcome to Arts in the City, from the beautiful gardens of the Noguchi Museum here in Long Island City, Queens. Long Island City has the largest concentration of art outside of Manhattan, and we're going to give you a tour starting right here with Isamu Noguchi, a 20th century modern art leader who moved here in the 1960s. Graham Douglas has more. He was also very outspoken that this was for the people of Queens. This was for people to have a place that they could come to as a respite from the world that they otherwise wouldn't know. It's an offering, in a way, a public offering from a life spending his time making work. I think he'd really like you to see how prolific he was, how involved with ideas he was, ideas of materials, idea of shape, idea of form. So he has this incredible skill of making very hard materials almost like light or like you could, don't you kind of feel you can lift this? Absolutely, and especially the way it's, the way it's positioned on the base like that. It, it doesn't look like it's actually touching it. It looks like it's floating a bit. And then of course you get to see yourself in it too. But this is this twist, which is like the way the wind twists things. You can see it from that That is the name too. of the piece? Night Wind. And if you see the title of this as Strange Bird, it, it engages you. I mean, this is very unusual. And, to have works like this just right on top of each other, almost as an installation of birds. Look what an artist can contribute to the world. Walk just one block from the Noguchi Museum and enter another transformational arts experience with the Socrates Sculpture Park, founded by another sculptor, Marc de Suvero, who, like Noguchi, wanted to bring art to the community. Marc was a catalyst in that he galvanize the community with a vision of what the land could be. The park presents the most sophisticated contemporary art being made today. It has a combination of things that is unlike any other place. It brings art and the public together through social programming, events, we have crowds of people who come and engage with the work, but also it's a natural setting uh, that's a parkland. So being on the waterfront is extraordinary with the backdrop of Manhattan. We do an enormous amount of programming. So uh, in addition to the visual arts programming, which uh, consists of commissioning artists to do site-specific work or uh, an exhibition that includes a, a lot of different artists, we have a whole host of programs that relate to art or at least creativity. All of our programming is absolutely free and we're open 365 days a year. Another gallery which promotes new ideas and experimentation is the Sculpture Center, which relocated from Manhattan to a former trolley repair factory. We look at the field of contemporary art from the perspective of sculpture. So as you can see, we have work that's both photography, sculpture, video, we encompass a lot of ways that artists make work, but we do it as we think about sculpture and artists think about sculpture. So it's introducing artists to New York audiences that have not shown here before, and that's, that's a really um, central to what we do. This piece is called Kabuki Chefs, and it's by an artist named Anthea Hamilton. She's based in London. I think of it as sort of a deconstructed kitchen and gets to the way that, for many people, kitchens have somewhat become staging areas. The implements of the kitchen are props and status symbols as much as they are utensils and objects of labor. I tell people that Sculpture Center is a place where those artists who are really thinking through those questions about like what is this object that we live with every day? How is a piece of art different than a salt shaker? Um, and I think the, these artists are really questioning all that and, and thinking about how to put art back into the world in a way that changes the way we think about not just art but about the things around us. I always encourage people to, to sort of check their prejudice about sculpture at the door, you know, that preconception, and just be open to looking at it for what it is. And after having your mind turned around in new ways, you can stop by one of the neighborhood's many cafes and restaurants. I'm Graham Douglas for Arts in the City. You could call him a modern-day Renaissance man, since his interests span music, acting, producing, and more. Tina Beth Pina sat down with John Forte to hear his amazing story. So 
sing this song for our heart. Tell the world who, who we are. May the sun shine your light. I will never leave your side, your side, your side. My name is John Forte. I'm from uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn. I am a filmmaker, a producer, a writer, a musician, um, a New Yorker. My, my, my mom, who raised my, my sister and, and me on her lonesome, was never a, a pusher, and, and, and she didn't pressure either of us to, to do things. So for me, I, um, I remember signing up for, for music in school, so I picked up a violin when I was eight, and, and that was the beginning of it. While I thought that my training with the violin was good, I met kids who, who had, whose training surpassed mine you know, by, by, by many, many years, and that was really humbling. And then I had to ask myself, all right, well, if I can't be number one violin, what can I be number one at? And, and that's when I think my, my desire to, to be uh, the best lyricist that I could be, that's when that really emerged. That ambition led John straight to the executive level, becoming the director of A&R at Raucous Records at 19. It was here that Forte would be introduced to, and eventually become a part of, the celebrated hip hop group, the Fugees. From that collaboration, there was so much success. How did that make you feel? Here I am, 19, 20, 21, coming from Brownsville, going to Phil Texer Academy, coming home, uh, having the opportunity to work with the Fugees, traveling the world, being nominated for awards, winning some of those awards, and uh, then being groomed for my solo album. So when the album was released, it came out to critical success but commercial disappointment. So instead of asking myself, well, what did I do wrong or what could I have done better, it was so easy for me to say, well, you guys failed me. You know, the, the record company failed me, management failed me. So I went up to Sony you know, with, with, with one finger pointing at everyone else, you guys all failed me. And, and Sony swiftly released me from my contract, essentially dropped me from the, the label. John looked for a financial opportunity which would support his music and became a middleman who acquired couriers for a drug dealer. And it wasn't because I wanted to be a drug dealer myself, but I saw it as a means to an end. I would make enough money. Well, when the House of Cards did fall and two of the couriers were, were apprehended in Houston, Texas, uh, the only person they knew in the operation was me, so I ended up being named and, and being indicted. It was a first time nonviolent uh, drug offense, and in 2001 I was sentenced to 168 months or 14 years in a federal prison. Oh, no, penalties for suffering can seem so hard. Dreaming the days when everything's so dark. Tried to walk good, where does that road start? The show. I was about three years into my sentence that a friend of mine came to me with a guitar, but unbeknownst to him, I did not know how to play the guitar. He assumed that because of my musical background that, uh, that, that this would be the light that I needed in, in the darkness. And while I didn't know it at that moment, he was absolutely right, because days later I actually picked the guitar up and I strummed a little bit. and. Uh, and I was determined to learn how to play it. And I taught myself, you know, a couple of chords at a time, how to, how to play the instrument. And that was, that was probably the most empowering moment of my life because for years I'd been beholden to DJs or other people to make music for me, um, but I was never able to accompany myself. In 2008, John's 14-year prison sentence was commuted by the president, and he was a free man, a testament to the dedication of those who tirelessly campaigned on his behalf including iconic singer Carly Simon. I don't ever want it to be misconstrued that, that I'm, I'm glorifying the mistake that I made and that I'm, I'm somehow benefiting from that. Did being incarcerated change your musical sensibilities? Yes. I think, I think you feel like an animal when you, are, when you are in prison. You feel like an animal when you are in that cage. So I wanted to, I wanted to contribute to myself, as, as, to prove to myself that you know what, you are not a thing. You are not an animal and I think that that 
was a pivotal point for me in terms of how I would make music and what my music would be about. It would be about my quest uh, for, for, for dignity. In the years since his release, John continues his quest for dignity through new music, writing a memoir, directing films, and embarking on a multimedia adventure. It's the type of work that allows him to nurture that creative spirit within. Because for so many years, I was either living in the past, regretting things, or living in the future, and I hope this happens, I hope that happens, and I was taking the present for granted. So, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, it was what it was, it is what it is, and it will be what it will be. I can't change the past, and I can perhaps influence the future to a degree, but the only thing that I truly possess is this moment. I've been blessed, and I feel blessed, and the only thing that I can hope for is to continue to be blessed and to hopefully know that I am blessed uh, even at times when I, when I think that I'm not. The interview took place at the Elizabeth Street Gallery where John shot one of his latest videos. For more information about John and his latest projects, log on to cuny.tv. The official start of fall is just around the corner, and that means big blockbuster movies. Pat Collins has her roundup. George Clooney directed and co-stars in the World War II drama The Monuments Men. Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan is back with Chris Pine as the CI analyst, and Leonardo DiCaprio heads to Wall Street. My name is Jordan Belfort. The Earning $50 million a year, real-life stockbroker Jordan Belfort spent a fortune a living large in the 90s and spent nearly two years in federal prison for stock manipulation. The Wolf of Wall Street marks the fifth collaboration between DiCaprio and director Martin Scorsese. She's not who they think she is. She just wants to save her skin. Simple as that. Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence returns as Katniss Everdeen, the teen heroine of the Hunger Games sequel, Catching Fire. If we're going to survive, we need a new kind of soldier. When an alien species named the Buggers threatened to extinguish the human race, Harrison Ford selects a precocious boy, Ender Wiggin, to lead an army into war in Ender's Game. For Hobbit fans, the journey continues in the second installment, The Desolation of Smaug, December 13th. You ready for this? No. No way. Hey, Mom, I'm here. The film version of the Pulitzer Prize winning play, August Osage County, arrives in December, starring Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts. Their dysfunctional Oklahoma family confronts dark secrets and a recent tragedy. We'd never get out of it. I intend to love you until I die. Me first. Ridley Scott directed the drug trafficking thriller The Counselor with Michael Fassbender. With Tom Hanks in the title role, Captain Phillips recreates the events surrounding the boarding of an American cargo ship by Somali pirates in 2009. Look at me. Sure. Look at me. Sure. I'm the captain now. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange gets big screen exposure in The Fifth Estate, a based on actual events thriller. Benedict Cumberbatch, TV's Sherlock Holmes, changes accents and hairstyle to play the controversial Assange. Idris Elba portrays the revered South African leader in the biographical film Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. I want them to walk free in their own land. On November 8th, Thor returns to his home planet of Asgard in the Dark World. You sacrifice for what you believe. Chris Hemsworth is the hammer-wielding superhero. I'm going to do the thing that God put Ron Burgundy on this earth to do. Have salon quality hair and read the news. Will Farrell's Ron Burgundy and his San Diego newsroom buddies reunite on a 24-hour New York cable channel in Anchorman 2? Is that your foot between my legs? No. Oh. It was my hand. The list of Hollywood remakes include The Secret Life of Walter Mitty with Ben Stiller and an updated version of Stephen King's Carrie. I'm Pat Collins for CUNY TV.
wondering what to do around town for these nice fall weekends? Mike Gilliam has some answers. Hi, Mike Gilliam. For many New Yorkers, fall welcomes some of the best of the city's display of dazzling cultural events. At the top is a New York City ballet, celebrating its 50 years at Lincoln Center with 50 spectacular ballets in its 2013-2014 season. Highlights from the four-week fall program are Peter Martin's bold and provocative Swan Lake and a selection of George Balanchine's masterpieces. Whether you're new to the world of dance or a dance aficionado, the Fall for Dance Festival at the New York City Center is for you. Over 10 evenings, experience some of the most breathtaking and groundbreaking dance in the world today from top companies for just $15 a ticket. And two free evenings of dance when the festival's 10th anniversary kicks off at the Delacorte Theater in Central Park. One of the biggest events of the art season, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, comes to the Frick Collection in October. This iconic painting headlines a very special tour called Vermeer, Rembrandt, and Halls, masterpieces of Dutch painting, on loan from a prestigious Dutch museum. You're in for a treat when the New York Historical Society showcases the infamous 1913 New York Armory Show, which introduced European avant-garde paintings and sculpture to the American public. View the works of artists like Duchamp, Matisse, and Van Gogh, which excited and shocked audiences then and became a watershed moment in American art. Experience the impact that war had on Marc Chagall, regarded as one of the greatest modernists of the 20th century, with the exhibit Chagall, Love, War, and Exile at the Jewish Museum. For the first time in the U.S., this show explores the profound work Russian-born artist Marc Chagall created when he was in exile in Paris and New York City during the 1930s and 40s. Brooklyn Academy of Music's Next Wave Festival is the hot spot each fall for some of the most adventurous and cutting-edge performances by artists from around the world in opera, theater, music, and dance. This avant-garde festival will debut 15 new performances, including the much-anticipated U.S. premiere of the opera Anna Nicole. Brooklyn also features the Dumbo Arts Festival on the last weekend of September. The entire Dumbo neighborhood is transformed into a three-day celebration of art, music, and performance, something for everyone to experience indoors and outdoors in this bonanza of art. Finally, the annual Open House New York Weekend in October offers unprecedented access to New York City's bounty of architecture, design, history, and culture. Explore the five boroughs and talk to the experts who design, build, operate, and curate the city's most fascinating places. Bring your friends and family and rediscover New York. That's just a small sample of what's happening around the city this fall. If you want more information, you can get it by going to cuny.tv. I'm Mike Gilliam for Arts in the City. If you're looking for an ear-pleasing night out in the city, don't miss another top-notch season with the New York Pops. This fall, the New York Pops, the largest independent pops orchestra in the United States, launches its 31st season with a series at New York City's legendary Carnegie Hall. Under the leadership of music director Steven Reinecke, the New York Pops season kicks off on October 4th with an evening of jazz standards revitalized by international trumpet sensation Chris Bode. And on November 1st, the season continues with Broadway leading lady Montego Glover and clarinetist Dave Bennett in a tribute to big band legend Benny Goodman. For ticket information and the rest of the New York Pops exciting season lineup, visit cuny.tv. I'm Donna Hanover. One intrepid reporter and columnist here in New York City is also an author who has written a thriller that starts with a terrorist trial here at the United Nations. The protagonist is a character much like herself, covering one of the biggest stories imaginable. Right here at the United Nations, the reporter Alessandra Russo is, a, is late to cover the trial of an alleged terrorist, and a 50-car caravan is pulling up with the terrorist and they're going to perp walk him through the United Nations. The terrorist is taken out of the van. All the reporters are jostling, 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 and he walks right up to her and kisses Alessandra on the lips. 
Does she know him? Has she ever met him? No, she's never met him. Now everybody is convinced that she's somehow connected to this alleged terrorist who is, they're saying, responsible for thousands of deaths. And suddenly she goes from being a reporter to being the story. And without even thinking about it, all her colleagues are chasing her because she's now the news story. She runs and she sees that there's a church in Mary's garden. She seeks asylum, a priest opens it up and she's escorted inside to safety. And then he allows her to write her story there. And what happens with him? Well, the next day he helps her with a car and so forth to get out of the city. And then she hears on the radio that he's been murdered and she's the suspect. As a real-life reporter at the New York Post, Linda Stacy has never been in trouble for murder, but she definitely has a history of being in the middle of big stories, according to her colleague and boss, TV editor Michael Starr. Well, Linda was uh, one of the first to write about the Michael Jackson uh, molestation case, if not the first. Um, she was the first to interview the Gotti family here at the Post. Linda has also authored nonfiction books like Boomer Babes and A Field Guide to Impossible Men. But six years ago, she decided to write her first thriller. For research, she made many trips to Europe, especially to Italy, where she traveled with an 80-year-old priest officially registered as an exorcist at the Vatican. They found the Vale of Veronica in a little monastery up in the mountains about 200 miles outside Rome. There's a question in the book about whether Demio, the alleged terrorist, right. really is a terrorist or possibly the clone right. of Jesus Christ. Right. Do you think that the DNA of Jesus Christ really exists? I think the DNA of Jesus Christ exists on that veil in the Monopello Monastery. In every Catholic church, there are the Stations of the Cross. The sixth Station of the Cross is, is Veronica, who was the wife of a Roman centurion, supposedly, wipes the face of Jesus and his image appeared on a cloth. That is the veil of Veronica. The only thing is, Veronica never existed. She never wiped his face, but the veil does exist. 2,000 years ago, every Jewish man that died, first they'd place a napkin over his face or a veil, and then they'd wrap a shroud around it. I believe that what this is, is the napkin that was placed over Jesus' face. The Shroud of Turin, when the two are put together, they match up precisely and create a 3D image. Oh, yes. So you think this means that they were both around Jesus when he yes. died. Linda says there is a scientist nun who studies the veil and there are monks who guard it. One told her why it is called the veil of Veronica. He said it's Veronica. It's the Latin for true icon. And Linda is still stunned by what happened when she took pictures of the veil. I started taking digital photographs and they changed. The image changed on every single photograph. Some were growling, some were smiling, some had teeth, some didn't. I was just going just like that and every one of them was different. Inexplicable. I've shown you because you're my friend, but you know, it's not something I, I generally show around because nut job. <laughs> but Pope Benedict did go and pray, went up to that monastery. The monastery is called the Volto Santo, the, the Holy Face. He went there, he prayed before it, and two weeks later, he declared this little monastery a papal basilica in 2007. So you tell me. He believed. Yes. In the book, Alessandra begins to think it's possible that Demiel is the clone of Jesus and that the killings have been committed by others to frame him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was accused of being a seditionist. In today's parlance, that would be a terrorist. My feeling was, if Jesus came back, would the same thing happen again, or would we be more enlightened? In real life, when the book came out, there were parties, celebrity endorsements, and cheers from Linda's husband, Sid, other family members, and many friends. And there were accolades from great mystery writers like Nelson DeMille. At the annual Thriller Fest, where fans can buy books and get them signed by their favorite writers, Linda was welcomed as an exciting debut author. As Linda Stacy joins other authors, their publishers, and fans here at Thriller Fest, we are left to wonder, will there be a sequel to The Sixth Station? Where will this real-life reporter take us for her next explosive international saga? It's a mystery for now. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City.
Trying to make it as a stand-up comedian is not that easy. There's the constant traveling, the hecklers, and sometimes you have to put up with our own Barry Mitchell. Breakups are the worst, you know, because you break up and then you see all kinds of stuff that reminds you of that person, and it's really hard to get over them. Like, I dated a black guy for a while, and then we broke up, and like a week later, there were black people everywhere. <laughs> I'm Barry Mitchell at The Stand Comedy Club on 3rd Avenue and 19th Street. Carmen Lynch came to New York a decade ago to be an actress. Today, she's an internationally known stand-up comedian. Is she funny? David Letterman thinks so. One time I saw a mouse and it ran so fast and I screamed so loud that my neighbor came over the next morning and she was like, I thought somebody was getting murdered up here last night. <laughs> and I was like, and you waited until today? <laughs> What was the most exciting part about being on Letterman? Gosh, I'd have to say when uh, Dave kissed my hand. Kissed the right one, I haven't washed it yet. <laughs> Carmen, you have an interesting background. I grew up in uh, Virginia and Spain. My mother's from Spain and my dad was in the military. So they met via Barcelona. And I ended up in Virginia and then moved up here for acting. And I still do acting, but it's mostly stand-up. What was your first language? If I had to pick one, it would have been Spanish, because I lived there when I was three, and I started to speak more Spanish, and I came back to America when I was eight. I'd say English is my language now, more than Spanish. What is Apartment C3? Apartment C3 is a web series that I created with my roommates. <laughs> oh, yeah, bichito mio. I think my favorite episode was Pretty in Pink. Carmen, I just bought Pepto. Have you seen it? No, what's Pepto? <laughs> I would never take anything like that from you, like my best friend, roommate. Yeah, I need the bathroom now. I'll be out a second. Carmen's entertained our troops in Kuwait and Iraq. She performed at the Just for Laughs Festival in Montreal, and in some parts of the world, does her act in Spanish. In Seville, in Costa Rica. Here she is in Valencia, Spain. A mí no me gusta cuando las relaciones se cortan. No me gusta porque no me gusta el conflicto. Me pone muy nerviosa. Yo tuve que cortarme con un chico, la relación con un chico una vez, y dije, y él dijo, Carmen, ¿qué estás buscando? <laughs> what do you find makes Spanish audiences laugh? Um, everything, observational humor, whatever. Really? Because I've, I've watched shows like Sabido Gigante with Don Francisco, and it seems to me Spanish people just like to laugh at silly physical shtick. You know, people dressed as baboons and pies and things. Pero si es verdad, idiota, que te piensas que nos gusta todo. Right, right, that's good. But physical, slapstick. Like this? I'll have another beer, please. Learn how to tip. Where can we go to find out where you're appearing next? CarmenLynch.com or go to my Twitter, at LynchCarmen. This is Barry Mitchell for Arts in the... Ow! That's our show for today. For more information about any of our stories, you can visit cuny.tv. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson for Arts in the City.